victory of the Giants. Aren't you all happy? Uh, Ninety percent of you, I bet, are very happy. The other ten percent hate football. Bah! Enough with it. Big ugly guys banging into each other. What's the point? I relate to that too. When my team loses, that's how I get. I hate football. I hate sports. Concussions. Should be out there. My team wins. It's okay. <laughs> anyway, anyway, anyway. More stories today. Hopefully good ones, entertaining, interesting ones, sad, tragic ones. We, the stories right now are under the heading of the discussion of the medical diagnostic viewpoint, perspective, the medical model, different words you can use for it. Um, but not just that. The, the more specific focus is the, what amounts to an anti-phenomenological feature of the use of the medical model. But if you buy into the idea there that there really are these clusters of deviations from the norm that are symptoms of internal illnesses, then your task as a clinician, your first task, is to identify the particular clusters the person shows and then you diagnose that person. And when you diagnose them, you're not just putting a label on some qualities they show you. You're naming the disease that exists inside them so that they then, their behavior, their experience becomes seen as a manifestation of a disease. That's anti-phenomenology. <coughs> Phenomenology doesn't resist classifying, labeling anybody. Instead, it just says, what, are, what is this person showing me? What are they doing? What are they going through as best I can understand it? then each, each element, each feature of what they're going through that is shown, the inquiry begins. What is its meaning? What is its place in the world of this individual's whole life experience? Okay? So I, what, what I'm doing is giving examples now where we can kind of contrast the one and the other, and it's just a different way of explaining phenomenology to explain that with which it contrasts real profoundly and diagnosis it contrasts with. Um, so here's another example. Last time I gave you a couple of examples. Uh, here's a third one. I want to give a short discussion of what in, in the DSM-4, currently in use, and probably this category will survive into DSM-5, I would guess, the discussion of so-called intermittent explosive disorder, IED. Kind of weird, isn't it? <laughs> improvised explosive device in Iraq. We learned IED there, but this is IED in, in the psychiatric diagnostic system. It's another one of these disorders. It is defined by certain specific features that are shown in people's behavior. These features are, are dramatic deviations from what is assumed to be the ideal norm of mental health, the, the guy in the golden globe. The features, in turn, are seen not as just features that are shown. With qu then we have questions: Why is this person showing these features? Instead, they are they are symptoms that emanate from an internal condition, the disorder. When you put a the, use the term disorder, using a noun that becomes substantialized, reified, and is thought of as an actual objective illness existing inside the person. Okay, either in his or her mind, if you're thinking in terms of the concept of mind, or perhaps in their brain, some condition that is there that is showing itself and expressing itself by the symptoms that are there. What are the symptoms of IED, intermittent explosive disorder? There are three. They're kind of, they all overlap. There's really just one. But I wrote them on the board. Um, one is the poison, the individual, the patient, that you're going to be looking at, shows a pattern of relatively unpredictable but recurring explosive outbursts of rage. Okay. That's number one. Number two, these outbursts are accompanied by damage to the physical environment and sometimes to other people. It might include things like throwing objects into, into window, in through windows and smashing mirrors and pulling plates out and smashing them all or possibly beating the hell out of your family members. Okay? So you have... The first is kind of temporal, you know, it's to do with just periodically, not predictably, but recurrently, these explosions occur. Damage is done to the physical environment. And thirdly, the explosion is always way out of proportion 
in relation to any provoking, triggering circumstance that's going on. They don't just appear out of nothing. They're reactions to something that happens. But the things that happen are trivial compared to the magnitude of the rate of response. So those are the three features that define intermittent explosive disorder. It's considered to be a mental disease. I heard, a, I heard an NPR report on IED in this sense, in intermittent explosive disorder, about a year or two ago. And the, and the interviewer was interviewing a psychiatrist about it and asking what he thought caused it. And he had speculations about the emotional circuitry of the brain and the need for drugs, really, to take care of it, to correct the, whatever the problem was that was in the brain. And it occurred to me, well, there you have it, OK? Now, I want to tell you, so, so if you meet someone who is showing a pattern like this, you know, recurring rage, damage to the environment, out of all proportion to the triggering circumstances, if you diagnose them, you're not asking the meaning of the rage. You're seeing it as a sign of a disorder. That, it's, that's why I say it's anti-phenomenological. It's very hard, once you diagnose a person and think of them this way, to then return to the task of trying to understand the unique meaning what the thing might have in relation to a life. And that's what I want to tell you an instance of. So this is one of my clinical stories, a harrowing clinical story for me, <coughs> the one that had a good outcome, I'm happy to say. I have a, the second story I'm going to tell you today has a very bad outcome. Um, but anyway, in this one, the story is this, and I have to psych myself into remembering this and reliving and being taken back because it's a, the, the events I'm going to describe at least began uh, something like 25, 28 years ago, okay? But I know they're in my memory, and, I, and the night is coming back to me. One fine evening in my psychotherapy office in Highland Park, New Jersey, that I was using at the time, a young man had made an appointment with me. He was perhaps 30 years old um, for counseling, referred by his wife, who was a uh, friend of one of my former students, and so my name had come up, and so he called me up for help. And uh, I remember him walking in the door and sitting down. I knew nothing about him except that he was, what his name was and that he wanted an appointment, and I had made it with him. I didn't know what the story was going to be at all, so I asked him, what brings you here? Um, and he told me that his wife had insisted that he seek counseling and had made the, con her continuation in the marriage conditional on him, on him getting some kind of psychotherapy. I said, well, tell me what's been happening that she would come to, come to that place, and I, I want to know all about it. And he said it was because of his rages. And he went on to describe how for the previous six months or more, not a lot more than that, because it had begun at a certain point, but, and, but then it had continued and gotten worse and worse and worse, he had shown a pattern just like, just like right out of the manual on IED, where things would happen in his home that would then release this huge, angry, raging, destructive response where he would pick up furniture and throw it and scream and curse at everybody and menace them. He had not beaten his wife or children yet, but the violence was getting worse and worse. And it would be triggered by, by always, always the same thing, but very trivial. It was whenever a, one of his children, both, both uh, stepchildren, because he married his wife, she already had two. Um, whenever e any of the children or his wife or even his dog or cat would unexpectedly penetrate into his close personal space, like come up behind him and he wouldn't hear them and he would turn around, they'd be right in his face, that's what would do it. So there, there was a provoking stimulus for the rages that would release it, but you know, somebody gets within like a foot of you or, or less, and you don't see them coming, you turn around, you're suddenly surprised by them being there, then he'd start throwing objects and breaking everything, okay? So he fit the criteria perfectly. So that's what he wanted help with. And he said, I seem to, I seem to need what I think is, is coming, to, coming to be called man man uh, anger, anger management therapy, to manage this anger, okay? I don't know, anger management therapy, let's not worry about what that is, it's not interesting. You know, I'm sure it's important for some people sometimes, I don't know, but it, it once again would be, whatever the details of it would be, it would see a person with, with a pathological anger in some way that needs to be controlled and managed better. It would tend to skip over the task of investigating the phenomenological meaning of the anger in the overall total context of the person's life. That's what we're going to talk about here in a few, in a few moments. 
get my story finished and completed and everything. A little more just detail on him. He's 30 years old. He's married. He had uh, and with two uh, adopt you know, stepchildren because his wife had already had two kids. He was enormously successful. Had a PhD in an applied mathematics field. He had gotten it when he was 22 years old, working for a big company and managing their information transmissions and statistics and data analysis and things like that, making oodles of money. This is a long time ago, at least 25, 28 years ago. He was making upwards of $125,000 a year, only 30 years old, doing really, really well. Had a beautiful home in a, in a, in a uh, su suburb of New York City, gorgeous house, wonderful yard, kind of the American dream, really. Nothing was wrong to, from an outside point of view in this life at all, except the six months before, these bur outbursts had begun, and they were scary. The wife was terrified of him. But what was going to happen? And she was ready to leave him unless he sought therapy. So that's what he was there for. I, so I asked him in that first session to just tell me all he could about the outbursts, how often they occurred, give me specific examples of what he would break, how would the thing arise, how long would it last, what would cause it then to ebb finally. He, didn't, he was able to describe what happened, the explosions, and the rage would erupt. He'd throw things, yell and curse, and suddenly just it would be gone. And he'd be apologetic and ashamed of his behavior. And he'd be saying he was sorry to the kids, but they were scared of him to even be around him at this point. So it was a perfect case of so-called IED. However, I was, I was already working as a phenomenologist in, in my clinical practice at this time. I hadn't necessarily even labeled it that, but it was how I did it. I figured there's got to be a meaning for these rages. They weren't there six months ago, but they're here now. Why are they here now and they weren't there before? And what are they anyway? Because they do seem out of proportion, objectively speaking. But phenomenology doesn't look at things objectively. It looks at them subjectively. So there must be something about the intrusion into his personal space that releases this rage. From inside his world, there isn't such a thing as inappropriate responses. Everything's always appropriate to its circumstances as they are experienced. So what is his experience of the intrusion into his space? I asked him this. He couldn't answer that. He said, I don't know, something's the matter with me, doctor. I'm just, something's just the matter with me. I need anger management therapy. Can you provide that? All right. So the whole first hour I had with him was mainly just devoted to a, des a description of the so-called symptom. When I use the word symptom, I'm kind of invoking a medical diagnostic language, and so I'm uneasy with it, but I don't have words sometimes. That we need better, a huge, rich phenomenological vocabulary. Anyway, um, we came to the end of the session, and I had got been given a detailed accounting of many, many individual episodes of these rages having happened, what it did to his family. Uh, he had no clue as to why they had appeared or what they meant or where they came from ultimately anyway. He just thought something was wrong with him. And I was very puzzled. I, also, I had collected information about a little bit about his background. And I'll just tell you briefly and then go a little more deeply into it when we come to another episode that happened at the very end of our session. Um, he was a totally brilliant student all his life, like straight A's or A pluses from kindergarten on, one of these kids, an only child in a Jewish family, uh, with special talents in science and mathematics. And uh, he had graduated early from high school and went through college in two years or something, and then got into a PhD program at age 19, I think, and finished his PhD by 22, age 22. And then, uh, having graduated, he had special skills in quantitative analysis and applied mathematics, and he was picked up by a major corporation and paid 100,000 bucks a year right away because he was such a rare talent for them. So then he'd worked a couple of years at this corporation and met a woman who was also on their staff who had been married but got divorced. And he married her. And she had two children. That's, so that's the story. That's kind of the, the external Wikipedia description of outer circumstances and arrangements in his life, OK? So the first session was nothing, really nothing more than that biographical material plus the detailed accounting of the rages. And I didn't know what it was. I was completely puzzled. But I assumed there must be something more there behind these rages. So I said, well, listen, we don't know what, to, what it is or what to do. We've got to figure out and understand what these things mean. 
but uh, why don't we make another appointment in two days? And he, he agreed to that. He would come back the next time. But then, so he got up to leave. I shook his hand. I said, nice to meet you, and see you, see you on Thursday. This was Tuesday. And he went to the door and started to walk out, and his hand was on the door, and then something occurred that all psychotherapists know about. It's called a doorknob moment. It's like that, what a doorknob moment is, is that moment when the patient is going out the door, saying goodbye, and they turn and they say, oh, there's just one more thing. And that one more thing is thermonuclear in its significance, okay? Patients do that, they're just awful. Because they have something powerful inside of them, but they can't <coughs> come out easily and tell you what it is. And so they wait to the last instant where there's not enough time. And all patients do this. And I'm, I've had four analyses, and I've conducted doorknob moments where I was the guy saying, oh, there's just one more thing, and then I'd drop a bomb on the, on the therapist, basically, and on myself by telling the secret that has been, I've been harboring inside of me that made me feel so terrible or contributing <coughs> to whatever it is. So, you just, so it's like normal to do it, but if you're a therapist, it's maddening, because you don't want the bomb dropped dead last minute, you want it at the beginning. <coughs> So I said, what's that? But I got a little bit of an uneasy feeling because I'd already been familiar with these doorknob moments. Oh, there's just one more thing. Just one more thing, George. I said, well, what is that, David? I, I will call him. He said, I was thinking about something, and I just want your advice real quick, yes or no. I was thinking that later on this evening, I might toss a coin. And if it comes up heads, I'm going to kill myself. But if it comes up tails, I'll live for now. I was just wondering, do you think there's anything wrong with that plan? That was the question, okay? And you have to imagine this, me hearing this. I, just just when, when, I, when I told you the story, I got transported back into the emotional experience of what it was like to listen to this. I felt like about a, a, a 5,000 gallon bucket of ice water had been poured down my back when I heard this. Because I could tell with, uh, with certainty that he was deadly, deadly serious, and that if I were to say, there's not really anything wrong with that, I don't know, let's, or if I were to de deflect it and say, let's talk about that next time at the beginning, let's, promise me you'll bring that up, I was certain he would go out that night, flip the coin, and if it came up heads, he, he was going to be toast, and I would read about him in the newspaper. You just are, you're able to tell when people are serious. Sometimes you can't tell, and then you're in trouble, but sometimes you can. I was quite certain that this was it. Luckily, I had two more hours on the other side of this, free in my schedule. And if I hadn't, I would have canceled the next patient, because I would not let somebody say this to me and get away. I would tackle them if I had to, and bring them back. So I brought, said, David, come back in here, and let's talk some more. We're, this is very intense. Actually, I think there's something terribly wrong in, 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 there must be something terribly wrong in the situation that you're in, that you're thinking a thought like this. And we need to understand how in the world you would let your fate of living or dying depend upon the random tossing of a coin. Heads die, tails live. Also, I was quite sure that if, he, if it came up tails, he wouldn't live, really. He would say, ah, I think I'll go for two out of three. And he gets two tails in one head. Ah, three out of five. He would have been dead later that evening. I was sure of it. How would he kill himself? I don't know. There was a plan of some sort that he had. Jumping off a bridge into the water would be the easiest way to go. Anyway, um, so, I, so, so I more or less dragged him back in, but he was willing. He was passive with me and sat back down again. I said, we've got to decide what it is. And over the next two hours, we reviewed his life course, and we were able to identify exactly what it was that was going on. I was so happy. And, and our ability to do so helped us make an, make an agreement with each other that averted what otherwise I think was an almost certain suicide. So I'm real happy with this case. And I've failed in other cases. I am not a savior of lives. I've made mistakes. I've neglected to take things seriously. And people have lost their lives as a result. It's happened not a lot of times, but it's happened a couple of times. So don't think that I'm claiming any greatness on here. I'm not. Anyway, um, so what is the story? Well, it goes. It runs like this. He was a, not only a stellar student as a young boy and, and, and young man as he grew older and so on, and getting a PhD at 22. Who's ever heard of that? Scarcely ever happens. But that's what he was like. Um, he was the fulfillment of destiny 
in the eyes of his mother and father. He was so stellar that the father, but more especially the mother, felt that God had favored the family by creating a miracle in this child, a miracle, brilliant, precocious boy, who not only made them proud, but gave sacred meaning to the parents' lives. And so the parents had really devoted themselves to the cultivation of the talent and intelligence of this little boy, and felt their lives had meaning because of that. And without this child to give meaning to their lives, there was a sense that there was a background of potential devastating depression on the part of the parents. I don't remember the details of all that was, but it, they weren't really to totally intact as people. But they found salvation in their child. And what the child had done basically is comply with their expectations, their agendas, their need for him to redeem their lives and give it the sacred meaning they thought it had. And he'd knocked himself out from a very early childhood age, three, four years old, when he began to show the precocious intellectual talents and so on, to be pleasing to them. And he'd done that all the way through school. He was the instrument of the gratification of the parental needs. And this had transferred over to his wife when he married her because he had knocked himself out to be the really good husband that she wanted and wanted him to be and expected him to be. And he had knocked himself out also to be the good stepfather, to replace the bad stepfather who was a drunk and had been had the wife had had to leave some years before. So this, the story was a, was a story of relentless pleasing of others. And the idea came to us, this has got something to do with why he would toss a coin. He saw nothing wrong with that. Why should, I, why should I not toss a coin and decide whether I live or die? I said, how can you even say that? And his answer was, I don't care whether I live or die. To me, it's completely meaningless. So, I'm, so given that, what would be wrong with tossing the coin? I said, yeah, but there's a reason you don't care whether your life continues or not. Let's figure out what that is. Well, here it is. I'll just put it in one sentence. I put it on the blackboard. The reason he didn't care if he lived or died is he didn't feel his life was ever been his own anyway. It had been under the ownership initially of the parents, later other people, his teachers, his professors, his mentor figures, and then later still his wife and stepchildren <coughs> that he had become involved with. Okay, That was the secret as to, as to why he was indifferent. It's a profound sort of thing. Like, we all want to, or most of us want to please our parents and give them what they want and get their approval and so on, but there's a, there's a point where this can become so intense that you really give up your own soul, which then becomes captive to the agenda of fulfilling parental expectations. And you're not really, it's a kind of an annihilation state. You're not really, you're scarcely there as a person in your own right. By the way, I'm just going to say this quickly. If you know the movie or the book Into the Wild by John Krakauer, Christopher McCandless is the name of the young man there, he was an example of the same thing. He became everything his parents wanted to be, and then he discovered that he didn't exist as a human individual at all. And he broke away from his family, threw himself into the Alaskan wilderness, and died out there, actually. He basically killed himself. No, it, wasn't, it wasn't overtly an attempt at suicide. He starved to death, and, but he put himself in enormous danger, and it was a reaction to the same kind of thing. I recommend that book, by the way. I didn't care too much for the movie, but the book Into the Wild is a classic. I, I could have used that in this class and required it for you guys. It would be a beautiful case study of this kind of thing that I'm talking about. Anyway, so by the end of the two hours that I had with my friend David, we had kind of come to the notion that... Uh, his life had never been on his own, hence the uh, problem being of indifference to whether it continued or not. It didn't make any difference to him, because it wasn't his. If, he, if it would be lost, it would be lost not to him. We made the further kind of idea between the two of us that uh, we would work together, and the goal of our work would be for him to claim his life as his own, to take control of the whole thing, to replace the agendas of pleasing others with an agenda of making himself happy for the first time in his whole life. And in the context of that agreement, he promised me he would not flip any coins that night or next week or anything, okay? Then we talked about the rages some more. And the idea came to us, I don't know which of us first, that the rages actually were a reaction to what, what this whole thing was about. If the rages were reactions to feeling crowded, like in, intruded upon by the external surround, into the personal, private space of his own being. So the rages really were the beginning signs of a rebellion against the dictatorship of compliance 
that had really dominated his whole life. That, that was the phenomenological meaning of the rages. And it was very amazing to see what happened to those rages as a result of this discussion. It may be hard for you guys to believe that they vanished and they never reappeared. We nailed the meaning of the rages. It was a, a beginning sign of almost physical resistance against being crowded out and crowded in upon, which his whole life had been a surrender to the, to the agendas of the crowds that were around him. And for the first time, he was fighting a battle. The worst thing in the world for this man would have been to drug him so that his, so that his rages would disappear. What was needed was the, the, the connection to an understanding of what the whole thing was about. So I, I'm going to just tell you a little bit more about the case so you can hear how it came out. Uh, I worked with him for literally 19 years. I saw him twice a week and later once a week for the next 19 years. The theme of that work was entirely how to help David assume the control and direction, dir the director role of his own life, defining his own future, defining his own goals and meanings. In the course of that 19 years, he divorced his wife and left her. He didn't love her anyway. Whether he loved anybody was out of the question. Whether he was pleasing to them had been the dominant thing. So that marriage broke up. It was sad, but that's the way it is. He quit his job for the giant corporation and became a sort of independent contractor, offering his talents to a variety of different businesses and people. He was so smart and so talented. He was brilliant, brilliantly successful. Um, Ten years into our process of me just seeing him and just talking to him about almost nothing but what are you going to do with your life and what do you want to do and how can we talk about it that will be helpful to you, he had a period that lasted about three months of extremely disturbing, scary, debilitating death anxiety feelings. Like in the middle of the night he'd wake up and think he was having a heart attack and be terrified that he was about to die. And I'll just say this, and I don't know what it will mean to you guys, that uh, he and I were able to come to the notion that the appearance of the death anxiety after 10 years was a sign of fantastic progress, because finally his life had become something one would worry about losing. There could have been no death anxiety at the beginning, because who cares whether you live or die? Go off the bridge, you go. Goodbye. Nice knowing you. That's what he was like, just completely indifferent. That's what was so scary to me. But now he was afraid of death. And I noticed one other thing I didn't mention to you. He was thin as a rail. He was so skinny, it was unbelievable. He was really kind of borderline anorexic, but he did took just enough nourishment in not to kill himself. And I talked to him about that from the beginning. He said he hated food, he didn't like its taste, and if, he, if it was up to him, if he could just take some pills, that would be just fine, or maybe a quick injection every day. And he found also in the course of the 19 years that he suddenly, I noticed he gained weight. Suddenly he's 20, 15, 20 pounds heavier. Still thin, as thin, too thin. And I asked him about it, he says, well, I don't know what it is, but I've begun to like the taste of food. It was so cool. So, so the, these were like very physical signs. The taste of food, the death anxiety was kind of an emotional sign of a man who was coming to himself. So finally, after 19 years, he decided he didn't want to see me anymore, although he still came, came in once every six months or so for a couple of years for what he called a tune-up on the old auto body or whatever, a tune-up on the, on the, you know, what was under the hood. All I would do is just listen to him and be supportive of him as I, as I had done all the way through. And then I didn't see him again for about eight years after that. So it's just good that lots of time goes by. You see what happens. Then one day I was at a kind of county fair, you know, with all kinds of booths doing this and that, and I saw him with a woman. And I, I decided not to approach him, you know, because if, well, I don't want to bother him or whatever. If he doesn't want to see, he calls me if he wants to see me. That's fine. And he, he, was, he was, had an angry, pissed off look on his face. But that, what does that mean? You know, you just get pissed off at anything. That's fine. I saw nothing wrong with that. He was frustrated. The county fairs are horrible. It's dusty and awful. And horrible people go to them. People that are enormously fat. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I probably had an ugly look on my face, too. So good for him and good for me. But isn't that a good story? The medical diagnostic model is a joke. You know, you've got these glowing men in the... Up in, the, up in the globe and these men on hooks. and The man up in that globe, you know, he gets angry when it's appropriate. Like if you step on his foot, he goes bang on top of your head. You deserve it. But if you just creep into his space a little bit, he goes, could you move back? Thank you so much. That's what the man in the globe does. It's, it's a joke. Whereas in reality, if we look into the world of the person's experience, we see there's a profound central meaning that has to do with the kind of Langian threat of obliteration and then a reaction to that, that's what was happening to him. Okay.
So that's part one of my story. Part two, here's the theme here. I want to, this is really important to emphasize, I think. Maybe I'm the only person in the world who thinks so. If you are a clinician making use of the medical diagnostic viewpoint, coming to your people from that perspective, it's extremely unlikely that you will be sensitive to the impact on people of being told what their diagnosis is. Because the medical diagnostic model doesn't really focus on what a person experiences. It focuses on how they depart from the golden man in the globe, from the ideal of normality, okay? But some very terrible things can happen, and some interesting things happen sometimes, too, when people are told of their diagnosis. And I want to tell some stories about that. But, but, but a very central part of the story is also the, the, the problem, the problematic nature of the insensitivity to the impact of being told one's diagnosis that belongs to the medical model itself. Because when you're telling a person their diagnosis, all you're doing is giving them information about the illness they're suffering from, the disorder they exhibit. They have a right to know what you think of the disorder they exhibit, don't they? Isn't that just true and good? Well, not so fast because of the following sorts of things that can happen. Uh, first story is very bad. I, I, hate to, I hate to tell the story, but it's short, so it won't make you suffer too bad, too long. Um, a student here at Rutgers, some years ago, it would be about 10 years ago, he was not my student, I didn't know him personally, but one of my students I was very close to was his roommate in a, in a dorm, okay? <coughs> And to make a long story short, and the detail, I do not need to go into all the bloody details of it, the student who was the friend of my student and, and roommate in the dorm uh, began to show a, a developing pattern of emotional instability, like real bad waves of depression would just hit him out of nowhere. And he had a few sort of semi-quasi-manic episodes, too. Not full-blown manic episodes, but he'd get sudden bursts of feeling really good and joyful and euphoric, and then it would crash into the other, and he would kind of go up and down and up and down. And there, there were ongoing circumstances, difficulties with girlfriends and difficulties with academics, which were made, the difficulties increased as his m emotional instability and sleep disturbance started to show itself, too, for him. And so he wasn't, he wasn't doing well. And there's... Um, in his life, and, my, and his roommate, my student, and others who knew him actively encouraged him to seek psychiatric help or psychotherapeutic help. He didn't have any money at all, a little bit of Rutgers pathetic medical insurance that gives you nothing. It gives you, like, what, three meetings in a group of ten other people or something like that. I don't know what it is. Um, there's, there's not a good counseling service at Rutgers here. There, there needs to be. It should be wonderfully staffed and abundantly available to all students and cost nothing, that's what I think. Anyway, um, so, so, so they finally prevailed upon him to make an appointment uh, at UMDNJ with a psychiatrist to consult about the emotional disturbance he was having. And uh, so he went over there and had his appointment and sat down with the psychiatrist for a full, glorious 30 minutes. They talked, and he gave an accounting of the emotional changes he had been undergoing, and a little bit about his history. And part of his history included this, that his father, by whom he had been raised, was a full-blown card-carrying manic depressive bipolar disorder, okay? So that need to know that. Plus, the father's emotional disturbances over the course of this young man's lifetime as a child had been incredibly disruptive and upsetting and intrusive and disorienting and difficult and very, very traumatizing of him. So he carried very significant trauma from a severe psychological disturbance in his father. You guys with me so far? So anyway, so he finishes the interview, tells all this stuff to the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist says to him, how do I know what the psychiatrist said? Because the young man came back and told his roommate, who then told me. Uh, the psychiatrist said, um, well, it seems clear. I know what the diagnosis is. And the young man said, what's the diagnosis? It's bipolar, bipolar disorder is the diagnosis. And what I'll be wanting to do is prescribe mood-stabilizing medications for you. You will need to be on these medications for life. This is an incurable condition, but it can be managed. 
And so we'll give you some lithium carbonate or whatever the particular drug it was that the doctor prescribed. And I want you to come back in three weeks and report to me how this is going. And he wrote the prescription and gave it to the young man. The young man then left, said thank you, left the mental health center, went home and told his roommate what had happened, and then went out into another room in the dorm and hanged himself in his bed. Okay, he killed himself. And he did it as, an, as a direct reaction to what had happened with the psychiatrist. And he had not been dangerously suicidal. You never know when people go through these mood swings where they're gonna go, so the depression gets deep enough they might do something. But he took precipitate action as a result of this. And he had said enough to the roommate who then came to me crying to tell me this horrible story. And I said, well, what did he tell you? He said that uh, it basically was this. He had been, the boy had been raised by a demonic force. His father was like a, the devil incarnate in the family. He hated him. He was authoritarian, sadistic, brutalizing, emotionally scary, rages and rages, collapsing into suicidal depressions, horrible alcohol, sexual acting out, all kind of weird stuff the father would do. And so what the boy had heard when he heard that uh, he was bipolar, that had meant he was like the father. And when he was told that bipolar is incurable, that meant he was like the father forever and ever. And when he was told he had to be on these mood stabilizing medications for the whole course of his lifetime, that reminded him even further of his father. So, so, so to him, the meaning of hearing the diagnosis was a kind of declaration of the irrevocable truth that his life was to be his father's life once more. Are you guys with me? And he decided, I'll skip that, and hanged himself instead. The psychiatrist, what did he think? I don't know, but I, I feel like I know what probably happened. See, it wasn't occurring to the psychiatrist what it might mean to this young man to be told he was bipolar, because he is bipolar. He has mood swings, he, has, he meets the criteria, the Golden Globe man is, shows things, and he shows other things, the deviation fits a nice little cluster. The man has a right to know that mental disease he's suffering from, doesn't he, says, says the psychiatrist, so he just tells him, and you need to plan your life accordingly. He's not thinking about what it might feel like to be told this by this person, given the background of experience he had with being raised by the devil rather than by anyone you would want to call a real father. That doesn't even run through his mind. So then I have an, one of my virtual moments, too, here. The day after the suicide, um, the doctor was, I don't, I'm making this up, but I bet it's true, but I like them. Sometimes they make up things that are more true than truth. Now that really sounds whack, doesn't it? <laughs> but I think there can be that, like fiction can be more true than the factual history that is there sometimes, or capture a truth. So the doctor's sitting there in his office with all his books and charts and the big copy of the thick DSM ends up proudly displayed right there for him to look up the criteria for this or for that. And someone comes in and says, Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith, or Dr. Jones, did you hear what happened to the patient you saw yesterday? No, I haven't heard. What, tell me what happened. He killed himself. 45 minutes after your interview, he went home and hanged himself. Hanged himself? Hanged himself? Hmm. Well, I guess that confirms the diagnosis, because suicidality, dangerous suicidality, is one of the leading symptoms of bipolar disorder. Everybody knows that. So what I see him doing is cranking the facts of what had happened back through the lens of the medical model. I just use mixing metaphors here, but do you guys follow that? Rather than saying, oh my God, what happened to that man in our interview that pushed him over the edge of the decision to die? Because that would have to be, you'd have to look at how this patient experienced the situation of being with you at that moment, okay? Medical diagnostic model allows you, encourages you not to think that way. It makes it much easier, your work. It makes you kind of disengaged, uninvolved. You're not really at fault. Whatever the person does is just the symptom emanating from the condition. And so rather than look at what he, the, the, his culpability, his responsibility, which is what I would say, uh, he, he's looking instead just at a confirming sign in the diagnosis. Okay, so that's just one example. Now let me give you one that's the exact opposite of that. Patty Duke, the great actress. You may not know this, but she also is heart carrying bipolar disorder. She was diagnosed so long ago they used the old term manic depressive illness for her. Oh, a long story short about her is this. She was a child star, a multi-zillionaire as a little girl, or she made other people multi-zillionaires for the Patty Duke show on television and so on. You, you may not know about this, but I kind of grew up with this, so I know a lot about it and watched her on TV. 
when I was very young and so on. And I've seen her in movies, and she's a wonderful actress who can't in some of her roles. Anyway, as a, as a very young adult, she began a pattern of mood swings between very, very severe mania and very, very severe depression. And if you want to know what mania is, it's basically the exact opposite of severe depression. So rather than slowing down, a person in a manic state is speeding up. Their thoughts race. Their physical actions, they walk real fast and talk real fast, and you can barely keep up with them sometimes. Rather than feeling hopeless, despair, and the future is a wall, you feel like you can do anything. Plans burst out of you. They're cockamamie, harebrained schemes often. Their judgment is shot, but you're, you're, you're full of hope and joy. Rather than being a, a, a feeling low self-esteem, your self-esteem skyrockets. You feel like the most special person in the world. Often manic states are accompanied also by what is called hypersexuality. Um, that's, that's where uh, you, you, you just, you, the sexual impulses are just almost out of control, and you're ready to have sex with anything, animal, vegetable, or mineral. Okay, and <laughs> wild sexual escapades sometimes are, uh, uh, coincide with manic episodes. Severe depression, you couldn't give a darn about sex. <laughs> Who wants anything to do with it? You don't like anything. You lose the whole capacity for pleasure of any kind, including sexual pleasure, sexual joy. So mania is kind of the opposite of that. But sometimes people get into a pattern where they're swinging between the two. And it's really quite amazing. And that's what, the, and so that becomes the, uh, those become the defining cluster of attributes. Mood changes, having following a bipolar pattern. Men still, we're back to the men on hooks. We've, we've identified an illness. It exists inside the person. It's real. It's objective. It's a disease. Okay, that's the medical model for you. So anyway, Patty Duke, um, as a young woman, began to show such patterns, including the hypersexuality, but very severe suicidal depression, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And she uh, finally found her way to a psychiatrist. And she had her interview. I don't know if it was 30 minutes long, but. It, probably was much longer than that. But at the end of that interview, that doctor said, well, Miss Duke, we do, we do have an answer to what the issue has been with you. And she said, what's that? She said, it's, she said you, you suffer from manic depressive illness. It's a very severe mental disorder, but it is treatable. There are drugs that help to control your mood. You will be needing to have, be on these drugs for life. It's the same language, the same message as the psychiatrist had given the other guy who killed himself. But Patty Duke tells the story of getting this diagnosis in her very good bio autobiography. It's a book called A Brilliant Madness. It's her story of her own mental illness, so-called. Okay, And she tells the story of what it was like to be told this. And, and did she become suicidal after this? No, she went into a state of ecstasy. She felt like that this is the happiest day of my life. This is the greatest gift I've ever been given to be told that I was manic depressive. Why was that such a great gift to her? Because, and she explains this, she had thought that all her mood changes and instability and difficulties that she had had in her life came from the fact that there was a demon inside of her. That there was, she herself was like a devil, devil girl, who was somehow in league with the devil and it was causing these evil things to happen. And so being given the medical diagnosis lifted this terrible self-condemning, judging, attitude she had for herself that had made her even want to die. That means, I just have an illness. Hey, I just have an illness. It's great. It's wonderful. Let's celebrate. Let's go out to the movies. Let's have some champagne. So do you see, it's, a, it's, it's, it's again, it's a different phenomenology, but we're, we need to think about what the impact is of being told your diagnosis. There's so many stories I have about this. It's just unbelievable. Uh, I personally, in my own work, I'm reluctant to ever tell anyone their diagnosis because I know what baloney the diagnostic system really is. And I'm worried about what it's going to sound like to a patient to be told you're schizophrenic or your bipolar disorder or your, your sociopathic personality disorder or you're this or you're that, you're explosive. What would have happened to that guy if I would have said, well, you have explosive blah da da disorder? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what would have happened. It might have felt intrusive, and he might have unleashed on me at that moment if something could have happened like that. I don't know. So I want to tell you a little bit more about Patty Duke, though, because I have made a study of, of her, her life and work and her so-called illness, her psychological disturbance, and her, the history of the whole thing, and it's very interesting. Um, I have to kind of work myself back in time again to remember the whole set of ideas that came to me as I read and studied a brilliant madness. 
Um, it's a good book. About 20 years ago, I decided it would be a very fine thing to get uh, a series of autobiographies written by so-called manic depressive or bipolar disorder patients and just investigate, this is the literature of madness, autobiograph autobiographical writings of people who have suffered madness in one form or another. And I decided it would be a wonderful undertaking to focus on bipolar, okay? So Patty <coughs> Duke would be a, one of the people. Uh, Kate, Kate Jameson was another one that I got involved in. And I actually taught a senior seminar here at Rutgers on this and got a whole bunch of students together and we all tried to bear down on the material setting it as our goal to understand the phenomenological meaning of so-called bipolar disorder. Like, what is it that brings us about, looked at from a life historical point of view, taking into account the life it is, as it is lived and experienced by the patient, and getting away from the pure medical model of the whole thing. Now, you'll hear people claim in psychiatry that bipolar disorder is unquestionably an organic brain disease. I'm going to tell you something else now. Look deeply into the actual medical scientific literature and make your own judgment as to whether this claim is justified. I say it's not. I don't say I know that bipolar disorder does not have medical organic aspects to it. I hope that you would be certain that it didn't. But the claims outrun the evidence is what I think. And I feel the most important approach we can take to this so-called illness, this condition, this disturbance, which is real, quite real, is a phenomenological one. So that's what we were trying to do. So this is, this is kind of getting boring, this story, because it's so long and drawn out. But I want to get to the heart of the matter and tell you how, why it almost caused me to jump out of a plane at 35,000 feet. And you may wonder, how, how could it really do that? So I'm reading, the, I start reading the book uh, from Patty Duke, A Brilliant Madness. And I'm all excited when I opened it up for the first time. I remember I was at my father's house. He was still alive then. And I sat down in the bedroom, and the sun is shining in. I said, oh, boy, this is going to be juicy when I get in this book. It's probably the first sentence has something really cool in it that might give you a clue. It's going to be really great. So I opened it up to the table of contents. And then I was horrified to see something. I saw that um, she had only written half the book. Somebody else wrote the other half. That book is organized into alternating chapters, one chapter by her, the other chapter by a science journalist who takes the viewpoint on manic depressive illness that it is a biological disease. So actually, the, the, the autobiography is two biographies, one written by her, one written by this, this, per, this scientist medical person. Not, a, not an actual doctor, I think, but a person using the medical diagnostic model and very learned in it writing it too. She writes about her life as she lived it. <coughs> he writes about her life as it unfolds, looked upon as, an or, uh, as the unfolding of an organic disease process. Are you guys with me so far? So I thought, I want to rip out the stuff written by this journalist. It's garbage. It's not the first person authentic thing. I got really mad. I almost ripped up all up, only keep the other part. I was mad because it meant the book, which had been kind of thick, was only going to be half about her. So then I kept on going with the book, and I carried it with me on a plane trip to uh, California one day. I'd been invited to the Esalen Institute in Big Sur to give a presentation. I was all excited about that, and I was hoping to talk a little bit about the research in Patty Duke if I could figure out what was going on with her. And I was on the plane still trying to do it, because it would be one of my sub-themes to talk about the phenomenology of bipolar disorder, really. So I'm looking at it, and I'm still angry at, angry at her for allowing this other guy to intru be an intruder into her sacred narrative. I think an autobiography is a sacred document. How can you let somebody else come into it and just mess with it and interpose their own viewpoints and thoughts? They're not going to be yours anymore. The thing lo loses all its purity. Anyway, so I'm riding along at the plane, 35,000 feet, and I come to a passage in Patty Duke's explanation of one of her devastating attacks of mania and would have occurred 25, 28, 30 years old or something. I don't know what it was. It was still her 